actually. <laughs> um, all right. Well, good morning, good morning, and welcome to Inner Cultural Spark, that show about the spark inside people that drives them to spark change, focusing a lot on diversity, equity, inclusion, communications technologies, and creative entrepreneurship. So today we are talking all about the whites, white fragility, white privilege, white supremacy, and also the overlay and intersections uh, that are related to oppression with that. And it's such a big topic that I brought in not one, but two doctors to help us figure all this out. Um, we have Dr. Marcus Robinson, uh, Robinson. He is a social innovator. He's a cultural, creative, transformative leader. Uh, and also a mystic and educator. Um, he's led community transformation across North America, and he's currently the executive director of Collaboration, which is Chicago's theater for social change. Uh, we also have Mikhail Lyubansky. Uh, Mikhail teaches the psychology of race and ethnicity, among other courses, at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. And he writes on race, culture, and community uh, for psychology today. Uh, he also, for the past 10 years, has worked a lot and really focused a lot on restorative justice. So I'm thrilled to have both of them today to tackle these complex uh, subjects. And it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to uh, Intercultural Spark. <laughs> All right, good, right. good morning. I always like to do this right when I come in. I, I always want to be, I never want to be like the top. Like I always want to make sure that I'm highlighting my guests like kind of you know, both physically and, and communicatively. So, well, how are you both? Thank you both for being here today. I'm well, things are great. Thanks for having us. Oh, my <laughs> pleasure. My pleasure. And Mikhail, always great to see you. Yeah, good um, to see you. Thanks. So we've got a lot to top it, uh, a lot to cover today, but I wanted to start. I always do something called the exercise of the day. And that was a lot because of just also being a, a, a fitness instructor and, you know, doing the work that I do. I have settled upon this little known genre of fitness called interpretive aerobics, uh, which means <laughs> that, I mean, if we're using all of our communication approaches, so I have one that I thought was so fitting today as we get ready to talk about white fragility, uh, white privilege, white supremacy, and it's called Tabata. So Tabata is, are you familiar with it? So yes. Tabata is a form of high intensity interval training. It was founded by uh, Dr. What's his name? I have it here. It's uh, Dr. Izumi Tabata uh, in Japan. And basically the premise is it's 20 seconds as hard as you can do and then a 10 second break. So I'm going to ask both of you to join me. I also like this exercise because it's adaptable to all fitness letters, uh, fitness levels, because as hard as you can work, it can be self-defined. So uh, we're going to do, usually you do eight rounds. We're going to do two rounds. And uh, the first exercise is just going to be a punch as fast as you can. The second will run in place. Okay, three, two, one, go. So I want you to punch, 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 as hard as you can. It's only 20 seconds, so you can go really hard. Oh, if you're watching live, do it with us. Oh my gosh, 20 seconds feels long though. <laughs> Woo. Oh, keep it going. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Oh, and break. And then you just take a 10 second break. I needed that 10 seconds. <laughs> All right, three, two, one. This one, if you want, you can stand up and even run in place. Let's do it. 20 seconds. You can do your punches or run. Your choice. Do what feels good for you. 20 seconds, hard as you can. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and break. <sighs> oh my goodness. And thank you very much. That's the end of our show. We all have to go recover. <sighs> all right. Um, here's why I like that because Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Because I'm out of breath and it's a good start for the day, it reminds me of 
<laughs> when a fight, flight, or um, freeze, your nervous system. So when, and I'll say people, or perhaps white people, when we're confronted with conversations about race, you know, I feel like the running part for me is probably the babbling of like, well, I think it's this, and I'm going to pontificate and try to sound smart, and then I'm going to freeze because I'm positive I've said something wrong. <laughs> so I thought that was a great analogy for our conversation. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad I'm not the only one that's kind of a little tired. <laughs> well, and it's also really good for your heart because you get that intense, um, you get that intense heart rate and then the recovery. So it's really good for your heart, which means also, and then I'll stop with my exercise analogy, which also means the more that you can force yourself to get into those conversations, even if you have to back up, overall, you continue to get um, better at it and healthier. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Interpretive aerobics should go mainstream for sure. All right, so, <laughs> um, so what we, so I wanted to start this conversation. I had, had a it was with my sister. We were going on about semantics between what white privilege and white supremacy met, meant, and like almost the same day, I got an email from Collaboration about becoming, which is a program that you all do that is about, it says it provides space uh, and fellowship for people looking to understand white privilege, unlearn inherent white supremacy, and engage in meaningful dialogue around systems of oppression with others. So I thought we would start there because I think for our viewers, what are the definitions of the terms and, and can we all get common language about that? So Marcus, if you wanna start maybe just with the program about becoming, let's start there. Wow, but well, becoming is a is a is a gathering we have every first Tuesday of the month, six o'clock. Streams on our uh, on our platforms at collaboration.org. You can register there, and really, it's a gathering of people from all over the country who just really um, want to lean into the conversation uh, uh, about you know white supremacy and racism and oppression writ large. Uh, um, but for purposes of learning, growing, and connecting with others who are on the journey. So it's a, it's a great place to be. We we'll certainly welcome everybody to be there. The The subject matter, you know, is, is right there in front of us and we use the topics of the day. And it's really a dialogue group. So that it's a sharing of meaning. You share your ideas and what you mean by that. And we don't try to touch them or change them. And others share their ideas. And then we try to find some common ground that we can all stand on to say, okay, we can take this step together. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Do we start with though? I'm just wondering, you know, Mikhail, you talk a lot about, about race and you write a lot about it as well. And so I'm just wondering, are there objective then definitions, let's say, because it sounds like if you're coming together from community, we're gonna talk about it, what it means. Are there objective de definitions? Uh, Mikhail, what's your sense on that for those terms? Well, I think different people will bring different definitions to the conversation. <clears throat> and so part of what I think needs to happen for the dialogue to be productive is to build some shared reality about what some of these terms mean. And that, and that becomes just the first part of the dialogue. Um, mm -hmm. Because for sure, um, you know, any of these terms, the ones you mentioned, uh, racism, even race, is going to be just different people have different ideas about, about what those words mean and they'll mean different things. Mm -hmm. I'm, it's really wonderful that we're starting in this spot because I think something that makes people nervous is, is when someone says, well, it's white supremacy and, and this means this or white privilege or people throw the terms around. Often there's clearly there's an obligation when you hear them in terms of how do you, how do you respond or what does that mean for how you engage with society? Um, but sometimes we will get, we'll start fighting about the semantics of what the words mean. And that feels so unhelpful to me. Um, you know, one of the things I know I had trouble with, and I'm just going to blush and be, I'm just going to like squirm the whole time. I'm, I'm squirming on behalf of the uh, people of our viewers. If, um, and actually for people who are viewing, I invite you to ask questions live. We also often have questions afterwards. So we're happy to share that with people. And thanks Aaron for being here. And Aaron uh, is also a fitness buff. So he said that he was exhausted from our exercise. So I'm glad Aaron, thanks for being here and engaging with that. Um, 
Oh, and I say um a lot. Um means I'm not sure what I want to say, so I'm filling in with um. On behalf of our viewers, I don't usually do that. I'm usually very confident on the subjects. But I'm going to dive, I'll, I will start with one subject, which was white supremacy. So in the time between inviting you both to be on the show and being here, I did more research to try to become more comfortable with the term because that was where I, as someone who's Jewish, I conflated white supremacy with white supremacist. And so I heard white supremacy. I'm like, no, those are those people in the mountains that are like killing the Jews. So my understanding now, and I'd love to hear what both of you think that that white privilege has to do with the individual. It's, it's the skin that you have and the privilege that you have that you don't ask for that just happens because of your skin color. Supremacy is more the institutions or the systems that are built on that. White supremacy is something totally different. What do you, you're both nodding your heads. Who wants to go first? Marcus, what do you think about that? Please, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Take that hot one, baby. If you're <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think that's a good way of thinking about it. I, I mean, the funny thing is, I think a lot of the people who are in the groups that we think of as white supremacist groups, mm -hmm. a lot of them you know, we'll find some alternative, like there's diversity there too, right? So so there, there's a whole bunch that will identify as white separatists, mm -hmm. but we'll shy away from the supremacist term because, you know, it's a little, they don't want to own that piece of it. They just Wait, want- But what do you see as the distinction? This is fascinating. What is, mm -hmm. what in their mind would be the distinction between separatist and supremacist? Um, separatist is about having, um, space and uh the political power to to self-determine to to live with who they want to marry who they want to live in community with whom they want right so it's basically um you know a type of racial segregation um mm -hmm. without sort of you know saying although i mean honestly if you if you kind of go a little bit deeper there is a very clear discourse of supremacy too but they won't own it mm -hmm. you know like the way that you know, they'll own the white separatist and they'll even also often own um, racist as a source of, of self-identity. Um, but at least, but that distinction, you know, for whatever reason, you know, they're, 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 you know, it's, it's, I think a little bit like, um, like faith traditions, right? There's, there, there become distinctions that are really important to the people that are making those distinctions. And for, some that are on the outside, they seem somehow mm. less important. Oh, that's so yeah. interesting. Because when you talk about religion, like with Judaism, we have we have um, reform, conservative, orthodox. And as someone who's reform, you're, you're absolutely right. If someone goes, oh, you mean like the orthodox Jews? And you're like, oh, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. You know, so yeah, I see what you mean with that. And sorry, yeah. Marcus, now other yeah, doctor, yeah. yes? <laughs> yeah, so, so I also think that <clears throat> a piece of this um, business about the nuance between, say, um, a separatist uh, and, a, and a, someone who would own white supremacy is that, you know, so I, I see the separatists as, as kind of the proletariat class of them. They're, these are the working class of the white folks who go, well, I don't have the money, the power and the privilege. I just want my space and my people. And I don't want other people encroaching upon mm -hmm. that space because mm -hmm. they don't sense themselves as having power like in the normal sense of how we think about power today. Uh, and um, and white supremacy, though, is, is something totally different than, say, like a group of people. It's, 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 a, it's a cultural stance. It's a, it's a way of living that is the world. You know, it's not like we have a choice about it. You know, you mm -hmm. and I are born here in the United States of America or uh, come to the United States of America, and there's no choice about whether the context in which we live out our lives is inside of uh, a world, a culture of white supremacy, which ranks human value. And that's where the rub is. Mm -hmm. So a white separatist is saying, you know, uh, you know, I might be racist, but I'll, you know, if you can get up, go ahead and get up more power to you, just don't get up on me. Uh, mm -hmm. A white supremacist person who's holding the line for white supremacy would say, the lowest white person is better than any other kind of person there is, no matter how much they rise up, you know, kind of thing. So, and and so that's a that's a that's a that's a cutting edge that you know, hardly anybody will want to embrace that today. But the system of it mm -hmm. 
is informs every aspect of our lives. That's how I live with it. Mm-hmm. So it informs every aspect of mine. I don't know about y'all's, but it, mm-hmm. it tells me a lot about well, how to survive. <laughs> so why don't we look for a minute though? Because you know, I'm assuming, Marcus, when you say you're talking about being a person of color, and I'm wondering as we as we talk about this, do we have to define whiteness? Because you know, I've realized that actually it was. <laughs> It was Mikhail. Mikhail. So Mikhail and I, I feel like we're Twitter friends. We actually met by talking about race and stuff on Twitter years ago. And Mikhail, through something he wrote, dared me one day to spend an entire day with a button on my shirt that said, I am white. And it was because it was. I have no memory of this. I just heard this. I believe you, but I have no memory of this. <laughs> you had shared. It wasn't like it was a little bit. You had shared something that someone said that 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 was part of it. Is that being a person of color that you're kind of like that's the first thing people see when they see you. Often is that you are a person of color. Whereas me, I could say, "Oh, I'm a mom. I'm a woman. I like I could put all these things first. And so, what does it feel like? to have your race be the first thing. And honestly, I I, I was gonna, I, when, when I did it, I was gonna do it for a week and I'll, wait, my friend did this. It wasn't me, it was my friend. She was gonna do it for a week. It lasted for a day because yeah. like the person at the bank was like, oh, what's that? Like, like they, they, people, the way that people reacted to me wasn't who I thought I was. And I was like, oh, I don't like this. Well, so, so do we have to find whiteness do I guess do we have to? Do people need to claim their whiteness to even come to the table for the conversation? Diana, yeah, I just want to give credit because this wasn't my idea, and I, I want to make okay. sure that we attribute it to to the at least oh, my understanding of where it comes from. This was um, something that I read from a, a black theologian who uh, goes by the name of Thandika, um, and she talked about the race game and and yes, she challenged was, okay. people. And she challenged people to, when they talk about other white people, mm-hmm. to to use the racial identifier when they do yes, it in the way exactly in the was. way that mm-hmm. that white people often talk about people of color. And mm-hmm. I and so I think that's probably what was happening on Twitter and, mm-hmm. and what I anyway. And so uh, and I that was my sure interpretation. Gets for that. I mm-hmm. appreciate that so much. So, um, all right. So let's talk about that. So, so. Do we, if we're talking about white fragility, if we're talking about these different terms, do we first have to define whiteness? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I'm glad white folks are starting to ask that question because people of color got really well defined long, long time ago, right? And whiteness really never had, that's one of the privileges of being white is, is not having to be defined or, or categorized in any way, mm-hmm. which is to say subservient to everything. Cannot be categorized or labeled kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. so it's good that it now has a category and has a label, and people are self-identifying um, as white. But what you know, white is a <clears throat> is political and cultural more than more more than anything else, um, because you know it's not really a marker of your skin; it is a marker of your political stature in the caste hierarchy. Right, so that's really that's really what that is. And say and, a little bit more about that. Well, because because white really was you know white Anglo-Saxon Protestants in the in the 1600s, you know, the, in the 1700s. That's where the stuff actually came from, and um, and so it, and over the years, different groups like yours, say uh, being uh, Jews, get to become white over time. That's the thing you give up. You give up your identity in order to get into the white group in order to have a kind of a a conveyor belt of privilege that kind of ushers you like a glide path into the middle class of American life. So it's a status, power, uh, influence kind of thing. Whereas all others um, get to be black, right? At politically black. So, and what what the situation was back in the 1600s was, if I can t- tell the history about this, was that you know. They got slaves and they got indentured servants, and the slaves were mostly black because that's where they bought them from. And the indentured servants were mostly poor people coming over to the new world from Europe, and they were they were almost slaves, and you know kind of thing. So how do you tell the difference between 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 everybody? So you 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 made black the lowest of the class, and you made white my art themselves the highest of the class, and then you gave the poorest ones. Uh, in the white class, power, 
status over the lowest class so that the high, the lowest of the lowest class could be higher than the, the lowest of the indentured servant is more powerful and free and more capable of exercising power uh, than the highest black person. So, so it says that's how Jim Crow got to be so big is, is that every individual citizen had the power to inflict the rules and, and controls of Jim Crow because they're deputized as white and everybody else who wasn't white got the short end of the stick. Mm -hmm. And that deputized as white really feels like that's the whole idea of white privilege, which is hard sometimes for people who maybe don't have a lot of money to understand that that idea of privilege because of their skin color. But it feels like that's where, where some of that comes as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I wonder where um, uh, I'm just thinking because I know, Mikhail, your your family uh, immigrated from Russia and my husband is an immigrant from Brazil. And the big joke there is that he was white in Brazil, but he's Latino in the U.S. You know, so how did that how did that experience and that's where we talk about like the intersections of oppression. Like there's just so much. I mean, Marcus, we could spend three years just talking about what you just said in terms <laughs> of that cash and hierarchy. But I'm wondering how that intersection happens coming in as an immigrant, Mikhail. What did you experience from that perspective? Well, immigrants, the immigrant experience, immigrants expect to be discriminated against. Uh, I mean, I don't want to speak for everybody. I'm not speaking for everybody, but but as a as a group, there's sort of a mindset that, well, I wasn't born here. Uh, mm -hmm. My English may be, you know, somewhere along the continuum, but you know, in some ways, a subpar. I don't have <clears throat> the cultural capital. I don't have the social connections. Um, like a lot of immigrants come here with a mentality of it's going to be hard. I'm not going to be treated fairly, but my kids will have a better life. And so, you know, that that's a it allows them, I think, in some ways to <clears throat> it, it's a way of coping with prejudice in some ways. Yeah. yeah. Right. You know, it's a coping style. Uh, it, and but the story is that it's temporary. Right. And that's a story that that I think, you know, other groups can't tell themselves. Yeah, um, and I just I really want to underscore what Marcus was saying about um, the you know kind of earn, earning and in some ways um, you know the notion of whiteness as as something that's that has changed socially, right? So uh, probably no ethnic group is more identified with whiteness today than the Irish, uh, but there's mm -hmm. there, there's you know a whole body of scholarship about how the Irish became white uh, and <laughs> how they didn't mm -hmm. have the privilege of whiteness when, uh, when you know, during the initial waves of immigration to the, to this country, the Italians had a similar, um, you know, kind of path into whiteness, mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm also Jewish, and and you know, again, kind of coming back to some of the <clears throat> white suppers, white supremacists, part of their discourse is, you know, they'll put a lot of energy into figuring out who's in and who's out of the club of whiteness, and. Um, you know, and and Jewish people are often excluded and sometimes not. And so, you know, like there's that kind of uh, on the border status, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, you know, it, you know, kind of bring in privilege. Um, you, you know, I can hide my Jewishness in most mm -hmm. uh, in most circles. Uh, so, you know, whereas my skin tone is is readily visible. So so even if you know, even if I'm in a group that maybe, you know, doesn't accept Jewish folks uh, a whole lot, I can probably pass and can probably enjoy some of, you know, many of the privileges of this. Mm -hmm. well, what's, what I'm finding interesting and I'm not sure what the right ad, uh, adjective is, because part of me was like, oh, this is reassuring, because, but then I love when you're aware of your unconscious bias that you say something and then you get your bias at the same time because, because oh, if the definitions are fluid, it's reassuring because then I don't have to work as hard. Okay, that's what my friend would have said. Got it, got it. <laughs> I just, if I had thought bubbles while I was doing stuff, it would be really fascinating. Um, but here's, okay, here's where I would like to, to have us focus a little bit though. It's not that it's reassuring, it's, it's hopeful 
if there are different ways to approach it and if your lived experience is something that you bring to the table as opposed to definitions from the outside because those definitions are permeable it boils down to how do you how do you then make change that's really what what all these conversations are about is how do we get together and do it and so both of you bring a really deep wealth of experience mikhail you're heavily involved in the restorative justice movement and leadership there and then marcus with you and collaboration you're doing all kinds of community healing programs so that's really one of what i want to look at is what's what's the opportunity power and hope for convening people to have conversations for change I don't know who wants to go first on this one. I touched you the who hot potato the first class, time. I'll, I'll take it and then I'll pass it real fast. Okay. <laughs> so, and don't so, forget if you're watching live, please feel free you. to throw in uh, questions in the comments as well. But yeah, so, go ahead. So, so, so Deanna, uh, Mikhail, uh, I, 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 I would, I would, I would uh, assert this, you know, that the real issue of, uh, of, of dealing with the intersections of racism and mm -hmm. white supremacy. The problems really don't happen right here at the interpersonal level per se. You know, it's like you and I meet each other on the street for the first time and we find a way to, um, you know, use our social graces and whatnot to negotiate each other and then maybe even connect and find uh, a common bond that we can, you know, grow and develop over time. That is not the issue. Mm -hmm. the, so, but the opportunity uh, uh, is to uh, approach the issue from the standpoint of what if Mikhail, uh, Vienna and I work together to get at the systemic pieces of this, at the legalized pieces of this, of the rule-driven um, and social norm piece of it that allows us to, that frees us both up to have more of what we're lacking because of, 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 mm -hmm. of white supremacy. You know, th there is a cost to white people that is enormous. And then um, just in money alone, the numbers could be as much as a trillion dollars a year per cap uh, for, for, for white Americans. It could be that big. That, that's the cost we pay. That's the trade-off that we pay in order to keep the cash system in place. For example, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. there's, there's about, there's about 300,000 people on the south and west sides of Chicago, which are the lowest um, income neighborhoods in, in the and marginalized and compressed and segregated and pushed that way and systems are designed that way. Now, now um, uh, uh, the more normative part of Chicago, uh, um, say Lakeview or whatever, you know, the average household income is about a hundred grand a year. And in, and in the neighborhood I live in, in Inglewood, it's, it's about 30 grand a year. So just imagine parity of 300,000 people who are making $60,000 more, $70,000 more a year to spend into the economy. Mm -hmm. With whom? The business owners and, their, and the folks that they do transactions. Everybody would make more money just on that parity alone. Mm -hmm. And so you put you do that across every major uh, city in the United States of America, and you're talking real money. Now, and the money is the small part. There's a solidarity dividend that we should all be striving for, and I hope we can get to that at some point. Full stop. Mikhail, it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, you started talking about, about the money. I, I thought you were going to talk, talk about funding the prison industrial complex. Oh, let's uh, save some money on that. I mean, just imagine if we transform the, uh, uh, the 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 whole criminal justice system and we extract it from it, just the the profit from that system, let alone um, the actual need for. Because there are some people who do need to be incarcerated. Okay, it just happens that way, but not at the level that we got it. And right. then we could save that money. And it was. And what if that money was invested in, say? Uh, cradle to career services uh, that allow people to really, you know, maximize their human potential. Oh my goodness, what kind of world could we have? That would be amazing. Yeah, let's dream about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I, I just, I agree with everything mm -hmm. you're saying in terms of um, us being able to navigate our interpersonal interactions, um, but you know, it's all kind of playing out systemically. And I think mm -hmm. one of the things I wanna say about systems is they're often invisible to us Mm. Until something happens that that sort of, you know, makes the system become visible, but there's a, you know, in the last few years, um, that's what's been happening. You know, we've we've seen we've 
the criminal justice system and the policing system, which is obviously part of that, have become more visible to most Americans in a way that they weren't before. Mm. And, and, and in that way, there's now you know, kind of a spotlight on the racial bias, on the injustice, um, on the ways that, uh, you know, on policing practices and their use of force policy. And so, so you know, it's under scrutiny in a way <clears throat> that it just hasn't been in my lifetime before. Uh, and that's that's an opportunity. I, you know, I think it's still a question mark whether what we're going to do with that opportunity. But it's an opportunity to, I hope, meaningfully shift what I think has been a white supremacist system into something that actually, you know, provides uh, more access, equal access, and and equity for all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it reminds me. Years ago, I had a conversation with a woman. She was then president of uh, Truman College, and we were talking about how to approach social change, like social change. And I was saying that that I was always a proponent. I worked for city government earlier in my career, but the idea of working for social change through the system. And she was very kind the way she said it because I knew it kind of it triggered her a little bit because what she said was, you know, and she was a, a woman of color. She said, you know, for some people, it's it's too long. Like it's too long to try to go inside the system and reform and change and change. And and what was apparent to me in that conversation is I didn't have the same sense of urgency because I wasn't being impacted on my day-to-day -day life. And when you see all of these images and certainly with the verdict this week in, uh, in the trial with um, Derek Chauvin and George Floyd is that people are starting to see the, the urgent need for change because you're seeing how unjust and how many people are being hurt. You're hearing the personal to the, to the collective. You're seeing these really personal stories and you can't believe that it, that happened to that person, you know, a 13 year old being shot or, or, you know, as a mom, you're like, that could be your child. Like your child, you just, I think people are feeling the person you're hearing the personal stories and it's connecting for whatever reason it's not fair that it wasn't before but it feels like more people are realizing like we can't ignore this this is this is a conversation that has to be had now which is why i'm so excited that both of you were on the show today because uh, you know in the idea of language you have to have words to be able to talk about a concept and if you get stuck on the words and what they mean, and if you're embarrassed that, oh, I'm not gonna use the right words, you'll never get to the actual core meaning. And that's what's really important. Tiana, I wanna, so. I wanna there, that dichotomy, you know, sort of working within the system versus outside the mm -hmm. system, I wanna push back on that a little bit. I think it's okay. a false dichotomy. I oh. think I think we need people doing both. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, and I agree with you, uh, and I agree with the person you were talking to in terms of urgency. Um, so it's, you know, when I say this, it's not about, um, you know, sort of saying like, oh, be patient, you know, like we're going to get there. It's not about that at all. It's about effectiveness. And I mm -hmm. think if we want to be effective, the people on the inside need the people on the, out, on the outside to, to do push. the agitation and to provide them with political cover to push the agenda that they want to push. Uh, but then, you know, that it's too politically risky without the outside agitators. At the same time, without the people on the inside, the outside agitators, they, they can do what they do, but they're yes, they're not yeah. positioned to change policy uh, and to implement the change. You know, so so really, you know, sometimes these groups are pitted against each other, and I think that's really counterproductive. Yeah, you, you're right. D direct action has its uh, direct action protest has its place, agitation has its place, um, lobbying has its place. You know, running for office has its place. Um, losing running for office has its place because it gives you a chance to create dialogues that otherwise wouldn't happen in public discourse unless someone put it at the center of a decision that needed to get made. Mm -hmm. um, that's important enough to them to make the decision. So then they have the conversation. So these these are super important things. And then like on the inside, you, you know, the hardest thing to do for, for a direct action protester who knows how to make that thing heard on the outside is governed on the inside. And the most difficult thing for somebody who's like got this most nuanced, delicate negotiating thing they're trying to do to uh, in a game of interest, trying to get, you know, progressive change to happen at the pace of glaciers melting, okay, 
uh, and to have a person outside throwing a rock, coming through the window and hitting the person that they were, <laughs> they were trying mm -hmm. to get the yes out of. All right. These are very, very difficult things. Uh, but the, the point is that they're necessary. They're mm -hmm. necessary. And power concedes nothing without a demand. All right. So it's so that you need that pressure. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, I think that um, that uh, you know we, we we simply at this point in our development as as in our feral development as humans, <laughs> we're not quite yet domesticated. I don't think <laughs> we are definitely feral, but you know we're pack animals, so we'll roll with each other. Um, mm -hmm. The the thing to do is to you know we, we we need our folks who are in polarized positions to have opportunities to work on stuff together, uh, to 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 actually engage around what could be seen as meaningless incremental change, and it might be in the larger scheme of thing, but it isn't the change that we're after in the policy or practice that we're doing. It is the meaningful engagement and humanizing of the other. That is required so that we can then take more risk with each other around, you know, like doing this thing. Because let's say the risk. So police, defund the police, militaristic police. Neither one of them are good solutions, right? Uh, uh, and until we have an opportunity to actually gain enough trust with each other to take risks with each other, we we will always find ourselves in that polarized position. Because I really would like to take. 40% of the policing budget of the United States of America and put it into early childhood education, you know, mm -hmm. a bachelorette, bachelor, baccalaureate education. So everybody goes, like, we got to go to high school now, everybody goes right through undergraduate, you know, that, like that. Mm -hmm. Easy to do with the money we spend, don't have the will, and can't trust that if I pull the police out, will you stop throwing rocks at me? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, and only trust will allow that. And, only, and, and the kind of trust we need now is the kind of trust that people get when they're in the foxhole together, when their lives depend on it. And if they survive it, those, no matter how polarized they might have been going in the foxhole, if they survive it, they come out lifelong friends with generational relationships that last you know, forever. So I think that's mm -hmm. what we need in the United States today. Full stop. I think that's what we're going to hope for. And thank you both. I can't believe how quickly our time went today. What? Um, it's over? Wait, can you believe it? I know. Up. I know. We've got like a hundred more subjects that we're we not could stopping. Do. We'll just keep going. <laughs> Put a comma in it, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, you know what? Let's get back together again is what we should, because what I really love about this though, and where we ended up going is this idea. And it's it leads me to my last question for both of you. It's that everybody from who they are can bring something to the table and that that's what needs to happen. People just need to be fully present and not be and not um, be afraid, I guess, to, to come to the table, even when people have different ideas, because you can build that relationship. And that brings me to the last thing is, because the show about, that's what I realized with Intercultural Spark, is that oftentimes there's this spark inside you that drives everything you do. And it's not just like the millionaires that are, you know, doing a million things that, that anyone who that uh, people have the ability to make positive change in the world just from themselves. And this is a hard one, but for each of you, if you could put into one or two words what that spark is that drives your work, what would that be? Oh, wait, Chris does want us to start. Actually, that's so funny. Speaking of sparking change, I'll do it. Chris Brogan's the person who sparked me to even do this show. So see each one reach one. Uh, Chris is uh, here. So, um, but yeah, so what is the spark that each of you would bring to uh, bring to the work that you do? I think it's Mikhail's turn to go first. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting dichotomy. We were talking about you know the change needs the problem and the change needs to happen at the systemic level. But the spark, I think, you know, what drives me ultimately are the interpersonal relationships. I mean, I can't. I can't connect. I can, systems are intellectual. I can I can like organize my thinking about them, but mm -hmm. but it's meeting folks like Marcus and you and others um, and and finding some uh, common ground in terms of values, um, mm -hmm. in terms of like what we want to see in the world, and like I think that's what it is for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that 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 really says it all right there. I think that the, the solution is in social capital. It, it, it it's like so mm. what what if the what what if the organizing principle of our 
of our culture was social capital versus um, extraction capitalism. What if that were true? Wait, say that again. So if what, this what if the or central organizing uh, principle of our uh, uh, of our culture was around social capital or the connections and bonds between each other, mm. the networks between people? You know that that the pinnacle in life is not to be Elon Musk with all the money, but rather to be someone who's deeply embedded in community and society with a you know with a tribe of belonging. That you know that that's where the real richness in life is, mm -hmm. and 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 um so so that we get away from an extract as opposed to extraction capitalism, which is which is really about using free markets to you know to commoditize everything and make a lot of money uh, for a few people with the efforts of a ton of people. So okay. it's a different way of looking at the world. That's all. Absolutely. And, and so, I, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm just right with you. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I just want to say this relates to what you were saying earlier. I mean, it's the yeah. definition of community that um, the idea that that your well-being is tied into my well-being, that yes. if you go up, that benefits me. And if you go down, that hurts me. And yeah. If we can extend that sense of community to to all of us. Right. Like like that's that's what I'm hearing you describe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, self-interest aligned with greater good is how I live with it. You know, so when when mm -hmm. I I get my I get what I want by doing good with others and mm -hmm. supporting the the the, the well-being and support of myself and others. That's 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 a cool deal. Mm -hmm. I feel like that was the theme from a beautiful mind, wasn't that? What that economist said that the that going for the greater good would benefit the individual. That is an entirely other subject, though, about what is broken with capitalism, though, because that whole thing with companies, you know, what they make a four billion dollar loss and then the CEO got a 40 million dollar raise and they had to lay off like over 100 people to do that, that we we can. I don't know if I can fix that one, but definitely. <laughs> committed here. I'm so grateful to you uh, being here. And um, I just, I feel like this was really hopeful and helpful because so many people are afraid to engage in conversations because they're afraid they're going to get it wrong. And it really sounds like if you're open-hearted, positive, and willing to bring what you can to the conversation, there's almost like no way, and listening, there's almost no way to get it wrong because you're making those relationships and that's the foundation to move forward. So yeah, you bet. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you yep, so thank much. You. We'll have to get together another time. I just, this was wonderful. So stay with me. I'm going to end our show. Really grateful to see you both. And thank you so much. And thanks. So, wait, thank you so much for all the incredible work and studying that you did to come to this moment with so much incredible uh, resources and value to, to our listeners. So thank you. Mm -hmm.